Dear friends and family in Christ, may you know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that each and every day he is the way of your salvation. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for the faith that you've given to the early church, for the way that you walked with them, that you guided them, that you directed them. Help us each day also to seek your guidance and direction, that we may follow the path that you set for our feet, that we may know that each day that you have purpose and plan for us to carry out your love, to share your love in this world, that your marvelous light may pierce the darkness of sin, and that all may come to know you as Lord and Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, throughout the Easter season, we constantly see these texts from Acts, this early church text where miracles happen, wonderful things happen. 3,000 at a time are brought into the church. Time and again it repeats how, how they preached and they taught and people listened. How the disciples and apostles were able to do wonders and signs. How they were able to change the lives and transform the lives. It sounds like an exciting time, doesn't it? When we read those texts from Acts, when we read the writings of the original apostles, how many of you, had, at least at one time in your life, have, have wondered what it would be like to live in that time? To see the magnificent things the Spirit was doing at that time. To walk with them, to, to know that every word that, that you preach, that you could preach for hours as Paul did, and only one guy fell out the window. Okay, well, so maybe that's a little bit far, but maybe you have thought about that once or twice about those opportunities that the early church had to spread the gospel. They weren't sitting there thinking to themselves that, well, I wonder how the church over there on 6th Street does it, because they were the first church to do it. Before them was only Judaism, right? They were the ones who were fresh. They knew. But things, of course, were not perfect. Sometimes I think we get an idealized view, though. We look back and we, we think to ourselves, well, if only the church today was like the church then. We hear these numbers of 3,000 being brought into the church, and, and we say, Lord, why aren't you doing that today in our churches? Well, there's been countless books that have been written, so maybe we can adopt the ideas. Written, books written on church growth, on how you can become like that early apostolic church. Do ministry as the apostles did ministry. There's books that talk about being more of a Christ follower than a Christian. And they even explain what that means, what the difference would be. And maybe this idea, maybe it's a bit of an attractive idea. Because the early church, they, they constantly were seeing the Spirit work. They constantly saw God's hand at work among the people. It seems like we hear success story after success story after success story. No one slammed the door in their, faith as they, in their faces as they shared their faith with them. The disciples seem like they go wherever they can and people are open to hearing the message. And maybe sometime we're attracted to this. Maybe sometimes we look around the church and we think, well, there's something to be said to this idea that the church has become an institution. Church Incorporated will take your tithes and offerings. And there's even many outside of the church who have this perspective. That the only reason the church is here today is to keep itself going. And so this idea to blame the structure, to blame the institution, to blame the church, it's an easy one because we can point the finger somewhere then. But honestly, when we look at the early church, when we look at those early Christians, they had one thing that allowed them to do all that they did. It wasn't a special, you know, that they had some kind of special message because they had the gospel message we have today. It wasn't that they were somehow more winsome, that they preached better. It was that they trusted God. It was that they trusted God fully and completely. And isn't that what we see in Stephen's life today? This complete and total trust in God. He wasn't sitting there looking at himself and wondering, well, what happens if I die? But instead he was thinking, Lord, forgive these people. The early apostles, just like Stephen, all the rest of them too, they weren't thinking about how they were going to do it. They just know that Jesus commanded at his ascension, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them everything I have commanded you. And that's what the early disciples did. And it wasn't easy for them, was it? Because if we actually look at the, at the circumstances they were in, well, we realize that most of them gave up their homes, their properties. Many of them gave up their families. And like Stephen, most of them gave up their lives. I don't know if you realize this, but the early apostles, those first 12 that Jesus called, we know what happened to Judas right away. But with the exception of John, the writer of Revelation, all the rest of them were martyred for their faith. They were put to death because they believed and would not give up their faith. And so as much as it sounds like well, we should become like that church, I think when we take an honest look, we realize it wasn't all roses. It wasn't perfect. In fact, when you look at that church, they weren't trying to set a design for today's church. If you go back to Acts chapter 6, the beginning, we realize they had problems in the church too. Acts 6, Luke records the first voters meeting where they had to decide how do we use our funds? How do we take care of the widow and the orphan? Then they looked and they said there were internal squabbles. How many times do we hear more than once Peter and Paul getting into it? They weren't perfect. They trusted in God. They sought God's direction to share his gospel. And at times they were persecuted for it. Because listen, listen to why Stephen was persecuted. This comes from Acts 6. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Why was Stephen persecuted? Because he was able to preach and change the lives of people. His words were not just the words of tickling, to tickling ears, empty words, but they pierced to the heart as God's word does. As he preached, he was able to change lives and change hearts. And this scared the leaders of the synagogue, the freedmen's synagogue as it was called. This scared them so much so that like Jesus, they stirred up, uh, stirred up false witnesses to say that he was a blasphemer. They stirred up these witnesses so that they would, would claim that Stephen had mocked God. And then, full of the Spirit, they dragged him and stoned him to death. But there's a couple of details that you have to see before we get to his stoning. And the first one is as they seized him. Luke includes this at the very last verse of chapter 6. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now he wasn't saying, Luke there wasn't saying, oh, you're cute, you have the face of an angel, but instead that he was glowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. His face was glowing, his eyes were glowing, his heart, it was shown. And don't take my words for it, because if you look at the end of Acts 7, but Stephen, full of Holy, the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was full of the Spirit, so much so that his face glowed like, like Moses on the Mount, uh, uh, Mount Sinai or the disciples on Mount Transfiguration. He was, what we would say, on fire for the Lord. And he desired to serve the Lord and trust the Lord. And what an example he is to us. What an example the early church is to us. But how often do we follow the example of the early church? How often do we step out in faith to share our faith? How often do we confront the lies of this world? The apostles, they were willing to confront the lies of the day. They were willing to go before the religious leadership to challenge the lies that they were spewing to challenge the Roman Empire because they believed in God's Word. Because they believed in what Jesus taught them and because they had hope in their salvation. They trusted so fully in God that they, were willing, they would rather die than give up their faith. And I wonder, with these examples, can we say the same? Can we say the same? Seems so often instead we're full of excuses instead of examples. We're caught up in the ways of the world, the mundane of the world. Instead of transforming the world, we're conforming to the world. 
It's more comfortable that way. People don't get mad at you when you just agree with them and you nod along with them and you smile at them. They, they're okay, right? But when you tell them about their life, when you tell them what God's Word says, they don't always agree and they don't always smile. It makes us a little uncomfortable. Because when we confront the world, God's Word has a way of piercing hearts just as it did as Stephen preached his message. God's, way has a word, God's Word has a way of getting in there and making you feel uncomfortable, making your skin crawl a little bit because it convicts us. It reminds us of how many times that we have failed to keep God's law, how many excuses we've made. We have so many opportunities. Right here, we have a backyard that is full here in El Centro, in our communities. And instead we say, Lord, who, who are you going to send? As long as it's not me. We say things like, Lord, I, I'm too old. I've put in my time. The Lord counters that with an example. of, What about Noah? How old was he again when he, uh, when he started the ark? Was he too old to start the ark? God doesn't ask you to build, do a starting a building project just to share his love. Some of you, you, you said, that, said to me, you, you've, you've taught generations before, now you're sending them forth. Well, God answers that too, doesn't he? He doesn't say, you go and make disciples, but all of you go and make disciples. Keep making disciples. Don't stop making disciples. Or the excuse, or isn't that the elder's job or the pastor's job? Again, Jesus, he answers that, doesn't he? In fact, actually, speaking through Peter, he answers that. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All of us have received that gift of mercy. All of us have received that gift of God's word. Not one of us is here that without purpose to share God's word. Because we are all his people. His light has pierced each of our darkened, sin-darkened lives. In fact, in fact, he wants us to be out there. And he's put us in this time, in this place, for this very purpose. If God intended us for to be part of the early church, he would have, sent, he would have created us then. He would have given us moms and dads then. But instead, in this very time, he created you uniquely and wonderfully. And if you don't believe me, just look and see at what Scripture says. He knows the very count of hairs on your head. That's how much God knows you. He knows the genes that you have. He knows the gifts and abilities you have. Whether you happen to be a good singer, whether you happen to be a good writer, or if you happen to be a good speaker, or none of those. God has you here for a purpose and a time to share his word. To, con to transform the culture around us. Paul says it in Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What is our gift, our ability? We have the mercy, the hope of our salvation that transforms lives and cultures. God's word pierces to the heart. God's word changes lives. It is not a question of will God use us, but how he will use us. It's not a question of if God will use us, but when he will use us and where he will use us. And as long as we have breath and life, he will continue to use us. But it seems so often those excuses, they get in a way. And in fact, I would say all those excuses come from the same place. And I want you to ask the question, are you willing to die for your faith? Stephen was willing to die for his faith. That's how much he trusted in God. How much he fully trusted that God was even then preparing a place for him. But I think so often, here we are as Christians and we're, we're comfortably apathetic. We're comfortable with where we're at and as, as long as things are status quo, we're not willing to take that step. That step out in faith. We're unwilling to step out and confront our culture.
culture confront what has become the norm? Stephen wasn't the norm, was he? The apostles weren't the norm. They were bringing that message of Jesus. And they knew the risk that they faced. But they trusted God. If we can take anything from that early church, it is that same trust in God. It is that same realization that God can use us today wherever we might be. That He can use us in whatever situation or circumstance we may be in. And He gives us that hopeful promise that even as our lives are often not as committed, even as our lives are not as fully trusting of the Lord, God gives us the promise that He's fully committed to us. And He didn't just use words to give us that promise, but He sent His Son Jesus to show His full commitment that before the foundation of earth, God already laid plans for our salvation. Before the foundation of earth, God planned for you to be saved, for your life to have value. And so He sent His Son Jesus at just the right time, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem each of us under the law. To take on human flesh. To be brutal, brutalized and battered. To die for us, but then to live. So that we too might live. It is true that sometimes we make excuses. Sometimes we don't fully trust. But we have that assurance. That promise that God is fully committed to us. He is fully committed to you. And that is the hope we have to share. The hope that we have that pierces the darkness of sin with the marvelous light. The promise that one day the suffering and pain that we face here on earth will come to an end. And I just want to point out one last detail about Stephen's stoning to you. Right at the end there, I don't know if you noticed this, because so often we read that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Right? We hear that regularly in Scripture. But did you notice today? It said Jesus was standing by the Father. He was standing because he was ready to greet Stephen. He was standing because he was ready to embrace him and call him home. And he was ready to say to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. May your lives also be lives of purpose following God's plan, transforming this world, so that Jesus too may stand and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we live in a world full of distractions, full of fears, full of suffering and pain. We live in a world full of questions and concerns. But we know with full confidence. There is one unchanging truth, and that is our salvation in you. Reassure us each day that by your precious suffering and death on the cross, we are saved. We thank you, O Lord, for Stephen's trust in you, for the apostles' trust in you. We thank you, Lord, that you sustained your church of old and that you continue to sustain your people today. We pray that every day we would be willing and ready to share your love, to proclaim your gospel, to show others that marvelous light of salvation. Lord, help us in our weakness and our fears to trust in you, to know your full commitment to us, that we too may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.